All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of The Personal Collection. We have a special guest here today, Jim Beckett, the founder of Beckett Magazine. Hey, welcome to the show, man. I really appreciate you jumping on. Thanks, Ryan. Looking forward to it. Hey, no problem. And guys, if you want to check out, we did a three-part interview series as well. It is going to be linked down below in the description. So they're 15 minutes each. And what podcast platforms are they on? It's on all the pod. It's audio daily podcast i'll string them out over a few days and uh don't want to overwhelm them with our our brilliance in our three episodes but i had a lot of fun but they'll be released uh, next week or something any everywhere podcasts are you know apple Podcasts, spotify stitcher podcast i mean downcast overcast every cast (laughs) Perfect. So guys, check the link down in the description. And on, and on YouTube too. I, I post them on YouTube eventually just as a kind of talking heads, but because it's audio, but it's just Dr. James Beckett Sports Card Insights. Every, so, everywhere it is. So perfect. All right. I'm going to link them down below in the description, the YouTube link, and as well as some of the different podcast platforms. Make sure to watch them because I had such a fun time going over these and three completely different interviews as well. All the stuff that you see on YouTube as well. Really great questions. So before we take a look at some of your cards, I kind of hear like the backstory of your collecting history. Obviously, you started your magazine documenting prices all across the United States. You traveled to more card shows than I did back in the day. But how did your addiction to cardboard start? Well, like most addictions, it starts slowly. It starts with, uh, you know, just a little taste that I got when I was a little kid. My dad had been a collector. And so he bought me a penny pack of cards, you know, and I, and it, and then after that, I think I, I don't know how much money I spent, but, uh, uh, you know, when I was growing up though, one of the things that, that got me into it is I never could have, I never bought a box of cards. I'd buy a pack or two. I just didn't have that much money growing up. And so I had to be resourceful trading, flipping, you know, different kinds of things. But, um, so I, I was buying a pack or two at a time. And so it's, it's hard to put together a set back in those days, uh, but it was a lot of fun. All my friends collected, we all played sports. And, you know, my mom said, if it's a rainy day, you can play with your cards. Otherwise get out there and, and play whatever the sport is it's in season. So great, great childhood in that way. Uh, times were simpler. You just rode your bike to the field and played whatever everybody was playing. Choose up teams. So how did you... How did you end up going though from like as a kid flipping cards then transitioning well, to I had a younger brother so I had a dad that collected a younger brother that collected for a while so that kind of gave me more legs in terms of it and then when I was in college I was pretty dormant except I did answer an ad in the in the paper from a guy that was became a very close friend that was uh, the kind of the number one collector in this area at the time and we got to be good buddies and he wanted to buy all my cards history would be different if i'd have sold him all my stuff actually he wanted to buy all my dad's cards because i had my dad's cards plus mine and he said well i'm I'm more interested in these ones that are a little bit older and i said now i now i say i bet you were but but again we were good buddies and and then we wound up uh, organizing a collecting club and starting the first show here in the dallas area and uh and so then really uh, pretty soon, because I was working on my PhD in statistics, pretty soon I realized there was a lot of chaos, a lot of uh, a lack of knowledge. And so there were a few people that had some knowledge, but most people didn't. And the most people didn't want to share their knowledge. It was hard earned. And so I did price surveys that I published for free for like, I started in 76. And then by 79, the demand seemed to be there to do a book a, a, a book uh, length, uh, treating every kind of pricing every card in every in all the major sets. So I did that in '79, starting in '79. Every year, I guess since uh, I, I did it for the longest time, and then now I've sold the company, so other people are are carrying it on. And then we started the magazines, uh, baseball first in '84, and then you know football, basketball, hockey, and others. So I've explained it, Ryan, in the sense that. I went from a hobbyist that was just having a great time to starting a company. And that was great when it was smaller and then it got bigger and it, it felt like I was an executive in an industry instead of a hobbyist 
who love going to card shows and card shops and talking about cards and the sports with my friends. And while you're running that company, we talked a little about it a little bit, but you weren't buying many cards, were you? No, I only bought Rich and I, when Rich Klein joined me, he was kind of a similar mindset that we, we were, we were the, you know, main, I was the main one. And then he came and did a lot of help on the almanacs and the larger price guides that were trying to be exhaustive. So we would, if we saw something we didn't have, we didn't buy the whole set. We weren't trying to corner the market, but we'd buy a type card, you know, of something, whether it was 19th century, 20th century, whatever, uh, mainly sports didn't really do non-sports. So, uh, but I, I think it's a conflict. If you're going to tell people what cards are worth or what they're selling for, you shouldn't be setting the market. So, you know, it, on the other hand, so I wasn't trying to say, it's like, I've t- talked to you about this. It, I, I didn't like it when people said, Hey, what do you want to pay for this? What's it worth? I'd say, well, it's your card. You know, you need to, you don't have to give me a specially good deal. I, I, I want to know what you value this at so I can use that kind of unbiased information in, in the, the next edition of the price guide. If I can get the checklist and I know that this card is this, I can extrapolate in the, if there's an absence of any other data. And, and, uh, and then every year we get, we'd get more reporting to uh, further refine the, uh, what things we're, we're selling for. You'd be surprised how many dealers still ask, what do you want to pay for on a card? Even though there's so much data out there for them, people still always at the show. Oh, what do you want to pay for it? It's, it's, it's one of the, it's one of the worst things. They're hoping you're going to say something foolish. <laughs> you know, there's a theory of negotiation that whoever makes the first reasonable offer is probably going to lose because then that anchors, it'll never be better than that. So, um, so, but I, I, you know, when I had to throw out a price, I'd try to throw out something reasonable, but I, I tried not to try to let the person, you know, price their own cards. And, and it's like, what you realize is that if you don't know what this card is worth, you might know what something similar is worth. Yeah, that's been the best way, at least judging on some of the different examples that you don't really see at shows. I mean, you just have to use your best judgment and you pick up that knowledge so fast as you learn in the hobby. When you learn the different players, the different sets, the releases, you can figure out quickly what something should be worth or what someone else is willing to pay for it based off of its scarcity. But I wanted to go back when you're talking about the type cards. Did you focus primarily on the main American sports or did you branch out also to some of the European sports as well? I know we've seen the surgence of soccer cards within the last few years, um, but I w- obviously, I wouldn't say obviously, but I would assume a lot of didn't come over to America for the longest amount of time. Did you travel overseas to grab some of those type cards or did you just focus on American stuff? No, I mean, there, there was a little bit of a bias against non, not Canadian, but non-North American cards. You know, the British cigarette cards were considered very common and not that collectible because a lot of them you could like get the set and they, they, were, they were readily available. So I, I'm sure some dealers in America maybe stockpiled some, but most of them just thought those aren't, they weren't, they weren't illegitimate. They just weren't pursued. There wasn't demand for them. Uh, because the, because we had our hands full with all the different cards, because it's mainly baseball, and their baseball is America. You know there aren't European baseball cards to speak of. They're uh, Puerto Rican and you know uh, South American, Venezuelan kinds of Mexican you know cards, but not and even those were not highly sought back in the day. People had a want list of the standard sets, and that was and that was a big challenge. Now as the almanacs grew and we tried to uh you know expand the knowledge base yeah i mean it, it, and people were asking about it so but the the, the non-american sports the lacrosses the crickets things like that that just it just we just wasn't we weren't being asked about that very often now i think people are scrambling to see what else is out there that might be interesting and non-sport you know and and music and and uh, celebrity kinds of things. I, it's all legit, but it just was not in favor. It was not in favor. And, and we had our hands full, Ryan. To, I wasn't going out looking for work. I had a long list of things <laughs> I had to do. And uh, once we got done with one price guide, it was time to start another one. So it was year round doing price guides. Yeah. And so one thing I wanted to talk about too is 
you said people weren't really in favor of like the Venezuelans. When did that whole mindset change of people going after some of these other releases? Because like, for example, the Nolan Ryan, you have four different versions of it. You have the Milton Bradley, the Venezuelan, and also you have the Opeachy. And nowadays the standard tops one is worth the least compared to all the other examples with the Venezuelan being worth the most and a higher grade, impossible to find in a 10, nine, eight. I don't even know the highest, probably like a four or five, but you know, when did that whole mindset change in the hobby? Because a lot of people right now go after the scarce, scarcer type cards, but you were saying in the past, people wanted to go after normal stuff. No, it was too scarce and it never took off. Uh, you, it's hard to want something. I mean, nowadays you want what you haven't seen, but that wasn't the mindset back in the day. If you didn't know it existed, it wasn't on your list. And so like the Venezuelan cards, they never really caught on until some enterprising dealers that they could kind of make a market in it. You have to make a market in it. And they, they went down with a Venezuelan baseball player and put ads in the papers down there and came back with suitcases full of mostly not very good condition cards. Man, I can't and imagine. I can't imagine grabbing the suitcases full of Venezuelan cards today. Well, it, it was on cheap. It's cheap paper. Yeah. And uh, poor condition. A lot of them were stuck in albums and, and uh, it just was. And so that was looked down upon. That's my point. I mean, you had enough, you, you were trying to complete your tops and Bowman and play ball and Gowdy and, and uh, you know, other kind of leaf sets, things like that. The things from the forties, fifties, thirties, you weren't, that's what people were talking in the, in the hot dog regional cards. That's what people talked about at the card shows. They weren't saying, hey, who do you need for the Venezuelan set? And, and Opeach, Opeachy, uh, other than hockey, which was preferred, but for baseball, it was an afterthought. They were kind of the same card with its slightly different back, you know, and some changes, but not, not, not widely collected. And that's why I went to Toronto and I'd pick up, I made sure I had a type card for each one of them, but I never had a set of all those. I just wanted to have one to know that, that it was uh, how they were different. It is interesting though, that you were saying the food and beverage cards were still super popular. Now, they how did were those, super popular. Were they more expensive than the standard tops cards of the era? The, it was completely flipped. And one of the reasons it flipped is because it's hard to make a market in something that's too scarce. And then also you can't get the condition hype. You know, you can't to, to the, the condition rarity of some of those cards is so outrageous that if, a, if a, somebody new into the industry says, well, this is supposed to be a tough card, but it's only a five. Well, it's a five, but it's rarer than a 10 in, in a tops card. Uh, but they, they, they didn't think that way. They just thought what, Again, there's there's a sweet spot in our industry of if something has to be available, desirable, uh, so that people are going to chase it. And if it's too elusive, like some of these uh, European and and uh, early Panini stickers that were stuck, you know, I, I have some albums, but they they're stuck. <laughs> That's not a great collectible now comparatively. Uh, but the stickers were meant to be stuck. And, and the same thing with Venezuela. A lot of those in, in, uh, and in the, these other Caribbean kinds of sets, they were, they were cheaper. I think that's the reason why the 52 Mantle is as desirable as it is. Because even though it was in that last series, it still was a double or triple print. So it has that availability. And it's the iconic card. If you think about 50s, 60s baseball, and in America and Mantle was that player for so many people, especially being in New York. I mean, his rookie cards in 51 and it goes against like the, the philosophy in the hobby where everyone always says the rookie card is the most valuable card. The second card, some people say 25%, other people say 30% around 40%, depending on what it is, but it's completely flipped for that card. Well, if you were to say that the, this player has a rookie card and a second year card <clears throat> and the second year card is double printed, <laughs> and they're both in a scarce series that's sort of equivalent um but tops is more valuable than bowman just because they were the survivor of the day but uh, the other thing that happened ryan in response to your earlier question is that the rise of uh, player collecting and so mantle has a huge following uh you know you were talking about nolan ryan your 
palindrome namesake kind of, uh, you know, the situation there is that the regular Topps rookie card is, is really sort of, it's not plentiful, plentiful, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not, an, it's not a tough card, but the Milton Bradley <laughs> and, uh, is, is unbelievably tough, but it's not appreciated because it's too tough. And so, uh, but the player collectors are, you know, the really, really serious. So I want to have, I want to have a complete run. It's, it's that, that uh, vintage worth of a rainbow or something just that having the different versions. It's the four horsemen. It's funny. There's a, there's a subscriber of this channel. He actually lives in Dallas too. He's going after the highest grades of all the Nolan Ryan cards. I think he's down to like two or three. He has nines and tens of everything. It's incredible, man. Like the player collectors out there, the, the depth that they'll go to grab the best of the best and the scarce cards. That's a real dedication. Real expensive too. <laughs> definitely, definitely is. So once you ended up selling your company, did you just go straight away to buying cards? Did you take a break a little bit or what ended up happening on that side of things? I kind of took a break. I mean, I basically, when I sold the company, I said, you know, the, the, the acquirers were not interested in the company's cards, many of which had been mine from when I was younger. And I said, you know, I, a lot of these cards are mine. And uh, I mean, I can either take a lot of time and kind of split out the ones that are mine. Uh, and they said, no, you can just have the cards. And so all of a sudden I'm faced with having a big, you know, vault of cards that I moved to uh, kind of my uh, kind of not a barn, but a little bit of a, a small warehouse kind of thing. And it took a few years to just organize this stuff. And so I'd have some of my old employees not old employees, but my former employees, you know, come uh, on the weekend and, and we'd, uh, we'd sort cards and, you know, if something was, you know, we, we, we just get it organized and labeled and stuff like that, because it was in some disarray when we, when we sold. And then, then I thought, well, some of this stuff I don't want to keep and some of this stuff I do and some of the stuff I want to get graded and some of the stuff I want to just like give away or sell. And so that's been, I've been doing that for all these years. So I'm more of a seller than a buyer. You know, I always have less cards each year, um, but I've made it so now the last several years, 10 years or so, I probably, when I go to a national or a card show, you know, I can sit at a dollar box and spend and spend some money and I'm not moving the needle for anybody, but it's, you know, I'm looking, I don't want to say what I'm looking for, but I don't want to have a short list of what I'm looking for so that I spend two hours at a table and I'll walk away with two, $2 cards. You know, I want to get a, a couple hundred. And so I'm going to pick some local players, uh, some, you know, people that I know that would be interested if they come over or the player himself and uh, plus some cards that are just for me. So that's been fun. So I, I walk away with a stack of cards. I'm not, like I said, I'm not, I'm not making anybody's day <laughs> at the, at the, at the, uh, at the show, but I'm having a good time and visiting with people as I go. So with that in mind, let's take a look at some of your cards, uh, probably 10 to 15 or so kind of showcasing mm -hmm. off what you've collected your entire life. I had, well, th this, th this does not subscribe, uh, describe what, how that happened, but I will try to tell you a tiny bit about each card. That'd be perfect. Thank you. Okay, the first one, do I have to show this? Uh, let's see, to put it up here. Oh no, the green screen is taking it off a little bit. Let me see if I can delete my green screen. Hold on. There, like that angle works perfect. You can see the card. Anyway, it's a Brady Chrome rookie and it's a 9.5 and through no fault of my own. I think this was just, it just happened to be there. And it got, and Chrome generally great. And this used to be on my wall. My point was, I'm not putting it on the wall. It's too much of a temptation for somebody. So I put a nine paper up there just so somebody can say, oh yeah, you've got to, you know, the, unless they're a serious collector, they don't really care. Uh, next one, let's see. It's a big man. Oh, gee. Yeah, I'd say angle it like when you had it this way a little bit. Yeah, you can see it like that. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Again, now this is a 10. The frustration about this big men on court, Kobe, is that it's a 10. And again, no fault of my own. It was sleeved. It was in, you know, we had the, 
you know, some type cards of this. And the frustration about the 10 is it has three tens and a 9.5. And I submitted this personally. So if there's anybody who wants to talk about the integrity of the Beckett graders, they did not give me a black label. Somehow they found, you know, uh, some imperfection, which I cannot see, uh, because that'd be a that'd be a really good card in a black label. Wow, is that a, is that a rookie year? I I don't know basketball. No, it's 97, 98, but it's, no, second, it's year, then. second year. Yeah, anyway, it's a great about... card. Tough, tough insert. This is uh, uh, you know Clemens. Uh, again, I'm, I don't know why I'm picking these nine point five, but the Donner's Crusade of the of the number to twenty five. I just have that because that was actually a sample given to, to me or us, you know, from uh, Donruss back in the day. Okay, this is what the go back to the sample card. Do they stamp it at all? Like at the sample? No, it's unnumbered. That's I, you know, I had an episode with uh, Tanner Jones because he was he's coveting my uh, Jose Canseco of that because I have uh, uh, I have a couple of those. So uh, anyway, Clemente. But this is Opichi, and it's an eight, which is a which is a good grade for for Opichi. Oh, and it's Clemente, and again, it's uh, this is my point. I, I think it's it didn't go on my wall because it's too subtly different, uh, too subtly similar. You know, it's not different enough from people say, oh, that's a sixty-five tops Clemente. Oh, what's the big deal? Then they got to take it off, flip it over, and say, oh, it's different. Was that one of those cards that you picked up in the, the, the Toronto Expo? I got it in Toronto. I got it in Toronto probably 30 years ago. Probably 30 years ago. And I no. One thing with the Toronto Expo, do you see more like OPG vintage cards than you see tops? Or is it about an even split or a lot more tops? No, there's still a lot of tops there, but there's more OPG than you'll see in the rest of uh, the United States put together. <laughs> if you're looking for that. Uh, this is a tattoo orbit of the... Uh, of Dizzy Dean and it just shows this is a 1.5. I have, I'm not condition uh, sensitive. In fact, this card has been altered a little bit. Yeah, you can't really see it there, but it looks like there was a blemish uh, to the side of his head and it probably was not even power erased, but erased. And so why this is a 1.5 instead of an A, you know, you and I talked about that a little bit whether it's an A or 1.5, it's a very tough uh, card from from uh, from 1933. And near a uh, Chicago release, I believe, right? Is yeah, and it, actually, my dad, I, I don't think this was one of, my dad collected in Chicago in 1933. He had Gowdies and play balls and stuff from 33 to 40, 40 pretty much, because that was when he was, you know, eight to 15. So my dad's 96 now. Um, I don't think this is one of his cards, but he did have a couple of tattoo orbits. Uh, just to give equal time for Eric Norton, the Podfather, Hulk Hogan, this set I got in probably 1982. Again, you couldn't buy a type card. Nobody cared of wrestling cards back in 1982. They, these were a mail order thing, and I just was an exhaustive collector, and I collected wrestling and everything else. So, uh, And then I busted the set a number of years ago. I thought I better get that graded so it doesn't get – because it already gotten dinged up a little bit. Those wrestling oh. cards are tough. There's a guy out. I bought it from the in the back of the magazine. You know, I didn't subscribe to the magazine, but somebody said, "Hey, you can get these for I don't know what they were, five bucks or something." It was it was ridiculous. I should have. That wasn't my mindset. You know, my mindset was just to get get one. You know, uh, this I got personally. Uh, Mickey Mantle autographed. Uh, I've had this thing with uh, with uh, a couple people. Do you prefer? autographed or unautographed i think especially if it was personally autographed if i sat there or i stood there and he sat there um you know it's how this signature only got a six i don't know i haven't really discussed that with the 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 beckett authenticating guys um this is uh, jambalaya of uh scotty pippen i i do have a couple other players but it's a tough i just think it's a it's it epitomizes along with the PMGs, the whole idea of the creativity of the insert sets and the parallels from 96, 97, 98. So this is 97, 98, again, very creative. And I don't think that's why FLIR went out of business, but the hobby did not fully appreciate that. that. 
Uh, this is uh, my Eat Your Heart Out John Newman card uh, of the, the Jackie. Uh, when I look at it, it's slightly off-centered, but very clean. Um, and I love the card. I love the card. And the fact it hasn't, the demand has completely outstripped the supply. It's not, it's, it's one of the more common cards in the, in the 48 Leafs, but it's, but it's just Crazy expensive. It's taken off in the last three years. Yeah. And it's, yeah. and it's a great looking card. The satchel page is the one that satchel is insane. way, way tougher. It's 10 times tougher than Jackie. And Dobie as well, I believe. And Dobie is in that yeah, new house. And I, I, do, I have those actually. I mean, I, I see, that's what I was working on. I wasn't working on European stuff. I was finishing my 48 leaf set. And then I, after I got it finished, I, that's when I started doing the price guides. Okay. This is uh, Babe Ruth. It's only a two, but it used to be my dad's. So he had a couple of Ruth's this, the red background. Uh, I actually don't care what it's worth because it used to be my dad's. Um, this is uh, just an example of kind of a novelty card. It's a 9.5, but it's uh, it's Stan Smith. I mean, I played tennis when I was in high school. It was my, my main sport. And this is a Stan Smith GTE card that, you know, I just collected everything from back in 1990. It was uh, issued to the uh, Super Bowl VIPs, corporate sponsors. But I, I know Stan Smith now. And I just think it's cool to have something on my wall that I know the player and he was a Hall of Famer in a different sport. And a, and a nice guy to boot. Um, and then lastly, this not my favorite person, but uh, an iconic athlete, but this is a, a Tiger Woods. And I wish I could say that I was the one with the idea to have a card grade and an autograph grade, uh, but I wasn't. Uh, and so this is, you know, it's, it's 2002. It's, you know, it's autographed, so I, I kept it for that reason. But I'm not, I, I want to, I, I think people that love sports and love the players, they need to love the player as a role model for how to be great in that sport. <laughs> <laughs> a lot, Maybe a lot not of as a role issues. model for how to be great in uh, life or uh, other, other, other things, but, you know, people make mistakes. Um, at any rate, back to back to virtual so and my wall is so i'm starting to do some youtube videos where i'm taking a panel of the wall and doby's on there the and newhouser's on there because i just think if you're going to show one of their cards uh those are um uh, i guess they're for doby for sure it's the rookie i think it uh, is for newhouser as well and newhouser probably newhouser actually is older than that but i don't think there were i think he was unless he has like a bond bread possibly from 40 he probably had, he does have a bond bread but i think that's not something cons people would consider as a as a as a pack issued rookie card uh at any rate it's a it's a I, I didn't you know obviously i i respect what psa does but i'm not a set registry guy but getting hall of famers um you know rookie cards i don't exhaustively do that but i have too many cards and so when I'm doing my wall, I'm trying to picture one of each guy alphabetized of all the sports and it's pretty much all sports and just to show kind of a history of the hobby and a kind of an example of some of the cards. So I try not to have too many cards from the same set. Um, so it's not just geared up for advanced collectors uh, and, and many of them are autographed. Uh, some of which I got in person, but some many, most of which I probably got through trades or, uh, but then I had to get them authenticated. So I've had to get authenticated my own autograph. Uh, I heard about that. Not, That's not right. Something not right about that. <laughs> Something not right. I, I had to pay the fee, pay the fee. You're like, just give it to me already. I already know it's authentic. I didn't forge my own signature. Yeah. At any rate, the other the other problem I have is I have I have a lot of really fun cards, but it's it's like when I I'm waiting for a, a submission from uh, to get back from BGS of a whole bunch of cards, and when I get them, I'm gonna have to like Mike Moynihan, I'm gonna have to redo the wall. It's like he's got to empty the beast and 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 reload. Well, I'm gonna have that same situation. So there'll be some, uh, and so I've got some really cool stuff in there uh, that that I'm that I'll gradually show. But it's hard to just limit it to 12. So these were on top of my desk. Uh, and a couple of them were on the wall that I just peeled off, like the Jackie.
So is it one wall then with all the cards and what no, there's it? a thousand, there's a thousand, more than a thousand cards. So th this is one, one tenth of it, one, one okay. fifteenth of it. So I it goes know. all the way around. It's panoramic. It's all around this big, big giant room. Oh, that's so cool. And then you have boxes. And if I do my content creator dinner, which you came to the one that I had, it, it was at the show, but I, before that I was, you know, before I was doing podcasts, I was actually, I did one when I was doing podcasts, but I'd have a dinner over here in my, in my back house where I have a, a kind of a boardroom and a and my card cave and so the guys came back and could see so you, you get an idea of it so if you're if you're in town for one of those and we do that you know it's 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 been a lot of fun but like I said it's not geared just for advanced collectors because it's new and old it's not just baseball I've had people that said what is wrestling doing on there and then I've had other people say forget about all this stuff let me just focus where's the rest of your wrestling stuff no, I see wrestling. I see boxing, baseball, football. I'm trying to get, you know, I don't think I've got cricket. I, I may have one lacrosse and one cricket just to have it, but I, I need some help on that. I'm not, you know, little, tiny bit of soccer. You know, I, I really was pretty eclectic, but it was mainly stuff I was doing price guides of. So I would have a type of the card. And uh, so it's, you know, what you were saying about it, it's, it's not easy to get up to speed unless you know your lane. And yeah. if you know your lane, then you can you can concentrate on on getting up to speed in your lane. But if you don't narrow it to some lane, you, you're going to I don't know that you'd be miserable, but it's it's pretty impossible. It's pretty overwhelming. If you, I'm going to do all sports, all eras, all brands, all types, all sizes. So. It's tough. Well, I know we, we talked about in your podcast, you know, it's how the hobby has changed quite a bit. I mean, without the Internet or without all these guides that people are posting online or videos or podcasts i mean imagine how many sets that people find out from just watching a youtube video whether it's a card show vlog or someone's submission that they got from a grading company and they open it up and like i didn't know that card existed or didn't know about that player or the history behind the player and we're in an era where there's so much information out there that people can learn about i mean like when you were doing the stuff you'd have to go overseas pretty much to find out about all the european releases now well, we've we didn't do that though. I'm just saying our, our almanacs were an attempt to do that in book form, but it's it quickly became so heavy and expensive to print that it it just it just wasn't feasible. And that and no offense, Ryan, but that was leaving out the European and non uh, North American kind of sets because we we didn't have a lot of data on them and and we weren't being asked about them. Now, Again and again with the internet, you don't have any space considerations. It's 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 hypertext links and stuff. You just you just you know dig until you get to what you want. But the book form was was ran into its limitations. Oh yeah, and there's no like you're saying there's no desire for them. People weren't not going enough after cricket cards or soccer cards, so it made no sense to do that back then. Well, the other thing is, how many people do you know? Well, I mean, how many people know read books cover to cover? You don't read the phone book cover to cover. You don't read an encyclopedia cover to cover. There might be one out of a million people that does that. Or, or you, know, and you don't read an almanac or a price guide cover to cover. Usually, I did because I was, I was writing it. But it's very rare. And so that's how you pick it. So if somebody picked up an almanac and said, I'm going to start at the beginning and I'm going to, I'm going to read about every set. And then, and then I got a baseball encyclopedia and I'm, a, you know, or the online version, I'm our baseball reference.com. And I'm going to go through every player. Okay. You, you, that, that you take a lot of perseverance. And by the time you got to the S's, you might be forgetting the A's and the B's. I'll be honest though. I did that for some of the rookie cards. Learn when I was learning vintage cards, I'd go in the Beckett magazines. I'd go through 50s, 60s, 70s, learn about those type of players and then and that's, them back ahead. like i said that's it's probably paying dividends for you so I mean, it has it, it's a long cut but it it, it pays long-term dividends you know i'm i'm still uh working off that knowledge that i had from from doing that so much i have some muscle memory at least again for those eras i'm not as strong as like hockey i i just i gave up my season tickets 10 years ago so i don't track hockey very much anymore it's tough too with all those releases nowadays and all the young yeah. guns out there so much. So I wanted to finish off the episode, a few tips, advice for new collectors. What would you give them? Well, you know, it's kind of like when somebody falls in love, 
even if you think that if it's one of my dude friends and he's got this new love, I say, go slow. And they just, no, I'm not going slow. This is the one I'm, I'm all in. So, okay, but just, just go slower. And they don't want to hear it because, because there's passion involved. And I, I respect that, except that, you know, there's also money involved. And so, um, and what might be a little bit of money for some people might be a lot of money for other people. So in the context of, if, if it's just a, you know, uh, instead of going out to dinner, one, uh, you know, on, on some night, you're going to take that money and put it on cards, you know, that, okay. But if you're going to take your mortgage payment and put it on cards or something like that, it just, just go slow because there's a cumulative effect of learning and understanding. And the same thing is uh, just like in relationships, there's a cumulative effect of building trust. You know, you didn't just jump out and have a following. You built a following, you built trust, and so now when you're at the shows, people recognize you. They, I guess they recognize me too, but you, you build up a tr trust over time. If you come in and immediately say, hey, trust me, trust me, and, or, or, or act like you know what you're doing before you know what you're doing, you know, like I said, if you take your time and, and then if you're going slower, you're going to see that there's some people that are trusted by others. And you know who those are now, and I know who those are. But it's, and then you say, well, you know what, if I've got a, a question about a certain person or a certain card, here's somebody that'll shoot straight with me. And so, but if you're rushing into it, you just think, hey, I got this, I got this, you know, but, uh, you know, and if you're making $10 mistakes or maybe $100 mistakes, that's different than making $1,000 mistakes and 10,000, you know, people get caught up in the bandwagon and sometimes the music stops, there's corrections, you know, if, if the other advice is for everybody to think, regardless of what you read, not a bull market, not a bear market, it's a mixed market. Some things go up, some things go down. Most people think this is going to go up. Most people think this is not. Most people are usually right, but nobody is always right. And so if you just go slow and realize a mixed mark, it's a mixed market, some things might go up. They might go down, then up. They might go up, then down. And we've seen that in the last two years. You've seen it with your own eyes. It's been, it's been in fact, crazy, you can see man. it during the course of a weekend. You can so, see it across the, you can know when it's a good card show or a bad card show. When you see the people bring out the double bags of $10,000 and throw it at a table and say, I'll buy this type of stuff. It, I mean, that I think that was like the biggest shocker for me between going to like flea market and mall shows and going to some of the bigger shows. I think it was at Dallas. I saw someone drop like $50,000 in cash on a table to buy some cards and wax. And I was like, Oh my God, did that happen yeah. at a card show? No, I, I thought the guy refused the deal. Oh, he refused it. Yeah. Oh, it, I, it, I, I know the guy, it. the guy's a good friend of mine that was going to sell the cards. And he, he, it's not that he got cold feet. He just said, you know, uh, I've decided not to sell. And the guy dumps the, the duffel. That's what it was. Man. It. Because I remember just walking by and I saw all that cash on the table. I was like, there's no way it's not, this is happening at a show. I mean, I, I didn't see that happen at the National in 19. I'm sure that there's stuff that happened behind the scenes or stuff that was going on, but I didn't see it with my own eyes at the time. But when going to Dallas and seeing that, I was like, I can't believe it. Well, this is your show, not my show. But I, <laughs> I just would, if it was my show, I'd be saying, kids, don't try this at home. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not good to walk around with a lot of cash. Yeah. And um, even the banks get suspicious when you're <laughs> trying to take out more than $10,000. And the airlines do too, man. Like, and the airlines too. You know, cards. I, want to, I don't want to check that bag, but it's going to go through the metal detector. And if it's bricks of hundreds, you know, that, oh my goodness. <laughs> so um, on the other hand, if it's a $50,000 deal, wh what are you going to do? Venmo? Are you going to do some other kind of... Uh, you I don't know. even, I don't even know because I have not even dealt anywhere. I know, and even cash, you know, you, you, you know, you want to watch these TV movies that are these where people get duped and it's fake counterfeits, you know, the top bills are real. And, yeah. you know, I just, that would scare me, man. That would scare me. Hey, well, thanks again, man, for jumping on the show. This was a ton of fun. Yeah. Guys, make sure to check out Beckett's YouTube channel. It's going to be linked down below and also some of the podcasts I had a ton of fun. Catch you guys in the next episode. Me too. Thanks, Ryan. No problem.